Good morning, everybody. This morning, I want to share with you a message that I think is very important for all of us to hear. I'm going to use as my main scripture today, Proverbs 29, verse 25. It says the following, The fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. Listen carefully. The fear of man will prove to be a snare unto you. Who can tell me what is a snare? A tram. Okay, so God's word is warning us that there is a certain condition when this is found in your heart, you've already fallen into a trap. Now, what happens when you fall into a trap? You get stuck. And what happens when you get stuck? You can't go anywhere. You can't go forward, which leads to frustration in your life, which leads to a feeling of hopelessness and despair. Because when you look at other people, it's like, but they all seem to be doing so well. They're going forward in life. Why am I stuck? Why am You see, the thing is, we don't always realize that we are the reason why we are in this trap. The scripture says, Proverbs 29, verse 25, the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. So this scripture is revealing to us that one of the greatest weapons that Satan will use against us is actually the fear of man. Now, I want to make something very clear. There are people out there that I think we would all be pretty much afraid of. A man walking up to you with a gun, pointing it at you, I cannot see there being no fear. There's going to be some element of fear. The Bible is not talking about somebody that's at this point in time threatening your life. The Bible is talking about the fact that you've allowed fear to come into your heart pertaining to certain people. Whenever that person is around, you have fear. You feel intimidated. They might not even be threatening you at that point in time, but something in your heart becomes weak when that person is around. So the question would then be, do you fear man? And let's ask it in a different way. Are you concerned about what people think of you? Listen to me carefully. We tend to see fear as somebody's threatening me or somebody's intimidating me or somebody's maybe going to kill me or something to that effect and now I have this fear. But fear is something that controls you through another person and then somehow manipulates you to change. A lot of people do have this problem. They really are worried about what people think. It bothers them very much what people say. And because they've allowed that fear in their hearts, they are therefore also allowing another individual to control their thinking, to control their actions, to control their emotions, and ultimately to control their life. You see, here is the problem. Whatever you fear will always end up controlling you. And when something has enough control over you, it controls your life. Our churches on any given Sunday are filled with people who profess with their mouth that their life belongs to Jesus Christ. But there are many multiple people on this earth that are actually controlling their life. Because those people through fear control them. If you let fear of man affect your decisions in life, then let me tell you something. You are no longer in control of your own life. You have allowed another individual to control your life. Who does the Bible say who should we fear? Now, please listen carefully. We all know that we should be fearing God. But... How can I be fearing God if the presence of another person will make me back off and keep my mouth shut because I just don't need all the hassles. I don't need all the aggravation. The fact of the matter is, if we are fearing God, then we should not be fearing man. But if we are fearing man, we also cannot claim to be fearing God. Fearing man is the opposite of fearing God. It is to worry about pleasing man and obtaining man's agreement, man's friendship, man's favor, rather than God's. 
For most of you, this is going to take you back a very long way. But one of the best places that I can maybe try and sketch you a picture of how this works is when we used to be at school. You know, when you were at school, everybody wants to fit in. Everybody needs their little place in the sun. And it's not nice to be on the outside looking in. But sometimes, some of the groups that you really wanted to fit in, Diane, I'm speaking to you, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Hello? If I call her, yeah, now she's going to keep you busy for hours. The thing is, yeah, yes, now I want to fit in in a group. I want to fit in because these are the popular kids. These are the ones that, they're the movers and shakers. And if you're part of that group, people look at you differently. People show you respect. The problem is, in order to fit into this group, you are going to have to violate your principles. You are going to have to change certain things pertaining to who you are to make you fit in to them. What you don't realize at that point in time is you are falling into the trap of the fear of man. Because you fear these people above all else, and therefore you are willing to compromise whatever you need to, to be part of this group. But ultimately, what you don't realize is you are damaging yourself for the future. Because whatever you are allowing to control you will ultimately determine the destiny and the course of your life. How many young people got involved in something that they should never get involved in just because they had the fear of man grab their heart? How many people today are involved in drugs? Because they were at some place where they didn't have the guts to put their foot down and say, listen, yeah, this is not for me. Sorry, guys, I'm going home now. But you were worried about what the people think of you. And because it bothered you what they think of you, you stopped thinking about what God thinks of the situation. And at some point in time, you realize that your life ended up in the gutter. What does the Bible say? The fear of man will be a snare unto you. Let's stop thinking about fear as some demon standing in front of you, tormenting you. Or some guy putting a gun against your head. And let's look at everyday situations where we stop fearing God and putting God first. And we overstep that boundary and we begin to yield to the pressure that somebody is trying to put on us. And we therefore compromise our principles, our beliefs. We all know what's right and we all know what's wrong. And sometimes when you're alone, it's not that difficult to do what's right. But in certain circumstances, when there's a room full of people, it now becomes very difficult to do what's right because everybody's looking at you and you're kind of like on the spotlight. Here's what God expects of you, my brother and sister. God wants to see integrity in your life. If you can stand for it when you're on your own, you should be able to stand for it when you're in front of a hundred or in front of a thousand people because that is integrity. That is strength of character and that pleases the heart of God. But there's something that the devil has noticed. You know, Satan has been around for many, many years. In fact, the Bible shows us that when God created the heavens and the earth and God created the Garden of Eden and Adam was created and Eve was created, the serpent was already there. So the serpent was around when God created the first man and the first woman. And he was around when they had their first offspring. And he was around when they had their offspring. And guess what? He was around when you were born and he was around when I was born. And he's learned a couple of things about human nature. He might not be able to read your mind, but he's a very, very, very good study of human character and human nature. And he knows what makes us tick and he knows what brings us fear. And he will use that. He will use that to great strength and power to try and bring you down. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, whom you must resist standing firm in your faith. You know, sometimes when a certain person walks into the room and that fear grabs your heart, that's the enemy trying to push you in a certain direction. Where God wants you to go right, that fear of that man is trying to push you left. 
What must you do? The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Satan knows how to use things such as peer pressure, the fear of man, to get people to do things that they should never, ever, ever have done. But at that moment, that fear creates a paralysis inside and it sort of just drags you along. Now, let me tell you something else. The Bible says that no temptation will come upon man that God has not provided you a way out. When that fear comes, when that control comes, if you begin to cry out to God, if you humble yourself before God and you say to the Lord, Lord, I feel I'm being pulled in, I'm being sucked in by this, but I don't want to do this. Even in my weakness, be my strength. Something in you is going to change. Something in you will rise up. Because you're doing what the word of God says you should do. You are beginning to resist. And the Bible says that when we do what God wants, when obedience is in our hearts, the blessing of God is upon our lives. And something is going to change. It is to worry about pleasing man, obtaining his agreement, his friendship, his favor, rather than God's. If you are afraid of upsetting them, being rejected by them, or losing their friendship, so you do whatever you can to keep man's approval. How many marriages ended up on the rocks because one or two of the partners had a fear of man? They wanted to please somebody else and they weren't pleasing their spouse. What I'm trying to tell you is, the moment you begin to fear man above God, destruction will come into your life and destruction will touch your life. Instead of living your life guided by God's word, you will become guided by popular opinion. The best way to describe this is through peer pressure. It is called peer pressure. And the word pressure is there because man's approval or lack of approval forces you to alter your beliefs or your actions in order to please them. In other words, what you must understand is it is a pressure that is pushing you away from where you are supposed to be. And when the enemy pushes you left, you better start pushing right so that you can go where God wants you to go. When we stop resisting, when we yield to this thing, when we give in to it, we get dragged downstream. And when we realize what has happened, we are so far removed from where we're supposed to be that many times you can't find your way back. Peer pressure usually pushes you to live in a worldly sense and to live for the world. Listen to what Romans 12 verse 1 to 2 says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing unto God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We all have to have our minds renewed. And your mind is not renewed by positive thinking. You can't walk down the street saying, I am precious, I am precious, I am loved, I am loved, I am wealthy, I am wealthy. That's just nonsense. That's positive thinking. Your mind needs to be renewed by filling it with the word of God and let the truth of God's word eradicate the lies that you've believed and that you've built your life on. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. What should be your number one purpose in life? To live a holy life and to be the type of person whose life and lifestyle is pleasing unto God. Now, this is where the problem comes in, because when you begin to please God with your lifestyle, you begin to upset the people around you. Suddenly, they don't like you anymore. If you used to always drink with everybody and now you're like, sorry guys, I, I'm, me, I'm, I've decided to change my life. I'm not drinking anymore. Ooh, your best friends immediately become your worst enemies. 
because they don't like what you're doing. But how's the enemy going to work? He's going to work through them to try and push you back. And you must realize what the enemy is doing. Do not, this is your spiritual act of worship, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Every one of us, including myself, through the word of God, God's spotlight is going to begin to shine on certain areas of our thought life, our thought process, our thinking, our understanding, where we are out of line with the word of God. But you see, this only happens when the word of God fills us and we allow the word of God to fill us. I've seen something very strange out there in the world. When you talk to people about the word of God, and I'm even talking about church people, how many times have I not had people say to me, oh, it's not like that. It's not like that. But listen, you wait, wait, wait. I have not been sharing with you my opinion. I've actually quoted you what the word of God says. No, 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 it's not, it's not like that. You cannot have your mind renewed if you are selective on what you receive from the word of God. If you truly want your mind renewed, and if you want to get to the place that your life is pleasing unto God, then you need to accept the word of God, the things that you like, and even the things that you don't like. The world, the Bible says, friendship with the world is enmity against God. Because the world hates what God loves. Because the world hates God. And we have a choice. We're either going to live for the world or we're going to live for God. And in case you've forgotten, let me help you to understand the fence belongs to the devil. All those people that say, I sit on the fence. I'm not going to make any decisions about this. You've already lost. The fence is Satan's. You better be this side, not that side. The fear of man can come from many different sources. Let's take a pastor who knows that he should be preaching the truth. But the people sitting there that pay the tithes don't like certain concepts from the Bible. And they get irritable with him every time he preaches about these things. And so he compromises and he begins to preach what people want to hear. The problem is he's just turned his back on God. He's allowed the fear of man to cause him to compromise his values, to compromise the truth of the word of God, and he has sunken down to their level. He's given the devil power and control over the church. A girl can fear her boyfriend and because she fears him above all else, she can compromise her values and her position in life to please him. Sometimes a worker can fear a boss and therefore he can compromise his principles. A child can be fearful of the school bully. A sportsman can be fearful of their opponent. We need to remember that the fear of man is nothing other than a trap from Satan. And when you choose to yield to that pressure, you are also falling into the trap and that trap will bring you nothing but endless problems. There are many examples from the Bible. I'm going to share a couple with you. The first one that we're going to look at was a man who was called by God, who was placed in a wonderful leadership position and even though God had touched his life, even though God had blessed him and given him serious abilities and God had given him a very high position, he forgot all about it when the peer pressure came. His name was Aaron. Aaron feared the people when Moses was absent. Listen to this, Exodus 32. Do not be angry, my Lord. Aaron answered, you know how prone these people are to doing evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. I wasn't there. But I can guess what happened. Moses went to spend time with God on the mountain. Moses was the leader of this group, but this group was never very committed to him or to God. They were like the wind. Today we are, tomorrow we're there. 
where Moses had backbone, where Moses was strong in his convictions, Aaron was not so strong. And so the one morning, there was a whole group of people standing by his tent. And they said to him, listen, yeah, we've had enough of this. Moses is gone. You're in charge. We want you to do something. We lost. We need gods. This God that he talks about, we've seen signs and wonders and miracles, but where's this God? We've never seen him. We don't know where he is. We want something that we can touch. We want something that we can feel. You better do what you need to do. Make a plan and sort this out because we want this. What should he have done? He should have stood up and he should have said to them, listen, yeah, are you people mad? Are you people crazy? Did you see the power of God? Did you see how the, the water came out of the rock? Did you see how God destroyed the, the Egyptian armies? Did you see how God parted the seas? You want me to fear you above that God? Go away. But he had already allowed that fear to touch his heart. Instead of standing up for what he believed, instead of standing on what he knew, he compromised his beliefs. Because guess what? Probably at least five of them looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And they stood there with their swords. And they looked like there was going to be problems. And he just bowed. And he gave them what they want. And he paid a severe price. Aaron should have known better. But his fear for the people caused him to anger God greatly. That day, the judgment of God came upon the people and 3,000 people died. What caused 3,000 people to die? Well, there's a lot of things I can name. But number one, fear of man caused 3,000 people people to die. Then we have another man, a very well-known man. The first king of Israel was a man by the name of Saul. Saul was in a very wonderful position because when the Israelites eventually came to the point that they said to the Lord, we want a king, the spirit of the Lord moved upon the people and God chose Saul to be the king. And God gave him a promise, if you fear me, if you follow me, never ever will, your, uh, will the throne be devoid of one of your descendants. Your descendants will always stand before me as the king of these people. And so he became king. And there was a big fight and there was a wonderful victory. And he was given very specific instructions on what he could and what he couldn't do. Samuel said to him, this is what the Lord says, do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. One of the things that he was supposed to do is he was supposed to destroy the enemy completely. But he didn't. King Saul lost his kingdom for fearing the people and sparing King Agag. 1 Samuel 15 verse 24, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned and I have violated the Lord's command and I have violated your instructions. I was afraid of the people. And so I gave in to them. Why did Saul lose the gift of kingship that was given to him by God? Yes, we can say that he was disobedient, but what led to his disobedience? It's called fear of man. Saul's life changed that day because he allowed the people to intimidate him. What should he have said to the people? I am the king. I have spoken. Can I tell you something? If he did that, God would have backed him up. But obviously he didn't have that faith in God. And obviously he had that fear of the people, which meant that he did not fear God enough. And when he yielded to what the people want, when that peer pressure came and it pushed him where, where the devil wanted him to go, that started him on the journey of losing everything. There was a man in the Bible by the name of Herod. Probably you know the story. In Herod's time, there was a prophet by the name of John the Baptist. Now, one thing about John the Baptist, he was not, he did not mince words. 
he preached the truth. And at some point in time, he actually preached against Herod because Herod had done stuff that was completely wrong. And when Herod heard about this, he was angry. You see, Herod, if I remember correctly, wanted or married his brother or somebody's wife. But it was wrong. What he did was wrong. And so John was not afraid and ashamed to talk about that. And he shared to the people that this and this and this is not right. And he took him to task. But Herod was afraid of John. So he did nothing. And then one day there was a party. And at this party, Herod's daughter danced for him. And the Bible says that she pleased him greatly. And I'm sure he had one or two dopa in or something, because I, I, could, I just cannot see a normal person saying stuff like that. But he turned to her and he said to her, because of what you've done, because you've made me so happy, I'll get, tell me what you want, I'll give you anything, even half my kingdom I will give you for one dance. Sounds to me like Rishlu talking there. Or Jack Daniels. <laughs> and so she goes to her mother and her mother says, tell him, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So now here's a problem. He publicly made a decree that she could have whatever she wants, even half his kingdom. She comes back and she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. Now he was afraid of John the Baptist because he knew that John the Baptist spoke the truth and he knew that John the Baptist was sent by God. That's why up till now he hadn't done anything. But his wife wanted John dead. What should he have done? He should have stood up and said, listen, yeah, I might have said what I said, but you are overstepping the boundaries. You, there's no way I will not do this. That's a man of God. And we will curse myself and my whole family. I'm not going to do this. But the fear of the people around. You see, he had already shown what a man he is. If he now goes back on that, he's going to look stupid. He's going to lose face in front of the people. So he allowed the fear of the people that were staring at him. What are you going to do? And that fear of the people pushed him to say, go and let it be as she has asked. And they brought John's head on a platter. I wonder what Herod felt inside when he saw that sight. Because he never wanted to do this. But he didn't have the guts to stand firm in his convictions. Because he feared the people more than he feared the God that John spoke about. And you know what happened? He lost everything. There's another man in the Bible by the name of Pontius Pilate who had a meeting with Jesus and he had the opportunity to make a declaration as to whether Jesus was guilty or innocent and he had the power to pardon Jesus. But he heard the people shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And instead of standing on what was right, whether he believed in God or not was irrelevant. He knew what was right and he knew what was wrong. Instead of standing up and saying, because he said, I find no guilt in this man, he should have said, release him. But he did not. Now, we all know that this had to happen. But it's in the way that it happened. He allowed the fear of the people and his political relationship with Caesar that was going to be in jeopardy to crucify Jesus. And then a very well-known story in the Bible. Peter was a wonderful man of God. He, was, he had a fiery temperament. He was a go-getter. And Jesus could rely on him for pretty much anything. And he always had Jesus' back, except that one time. When Jesus said to him, before the crow... Uh, the cock crows three times. You will deny me. And he said, no, I will never do that. Let me tell you something. When he said to Jesus, I will never do that, he meant it. He meant that no matter what happens, I'm going to stand firm. I will never deny you because you are the son of God. I love you and I will always have your back. His heart was full of truth when he said that. But 
There was one test that he had not yet passed. It's called the fear of man. Because when the opportunity came for Satan to test him, it was in front of hordes of people. And a woman pointed to him and said, listen to that, that accent. Surely you are an Aramaic. You are one of those people that was with Jesus. You see, to say that to Jesus to his face when there's nobody around, he meant it. But when there was a couple of hundred people in the plane and suddenly they all looked at him and he could see that he was going to have problems, he forgot all about the promise. What was it that caused him to forget about his promise to God? It's called fear of man. Because when he looked at the faces of those people and he could see these oaks are ready to fight and probably he's going to lose his life today, he just bowed and he gave in. But it was because of the fear of man. Peter denied Jesus because he feared the people more. But then on the other hand, we have somebody by the name of David. David comes to the battle lines. He sees Goliath standing down there in the plain, shouting profanities against the people, against God, belittling God, being disrespectful. And this anger comes into him and he says to the people, but what, what the heck? Why is nobody doing something about this man? Why do you leave him to do that? And the Israelites answered him and they said, are you mad? Are you crazy? Did you see the size of this man? And David couldn't understand the way that they were talking because for David, God was almighty. For David, God was omnipotent. For David, God could do anything. You see, David feared God more than he feared man. The Israelites talking to him, including his brother, feared man more than they feared God. And that's why nobody had the guts to stand up against Goliath. Goliath was all that the Philistines really had. They had a big man. The Israelites had God, but they forgot about God when they saw the man. Unfortunately, their faith was very shallow. And then David said to them, he said, listen, yeah, I don't care what any of you say. If not one of you has the guts to stand up to this man, I will stand up to this man. Me and my God, we're going to conquer this man. And his brother said to him, you are mad. You are crazy. You are a little boy. You are an insignificant little speck of dust. What do you think you're going to do against this man? David said, Muni Warini, watch it. And you know what? He walked up to that man. First, they tried to give him armor. Take into account he was 16 years old. He had not yet developed. When they put that armor on him, he could hardly walk. He thought to himself, this is not going to help me nothing. Probably this will get me killed. He kicked it off. When he went to confront this giant of a man, he went there without any protection. But maybe that's what everybody thought. God was his protector. And maybe people thought to themselves, how is he going to conquer this man? Because all he has is a slingshot. But he had something more than that. Because God would fight his battles for him. And when he stood in front of that giant, there was no fear of the giant in his heart. Because his heart was filled with the fear of God. And there was no place for fear of man. And we all know the outcome. He released that little pebble. He picked up five smooth stones. Pebbles. Maybe like probably the size of a marble. And when he released that marble, you would swear that it was a, three, a 308 Mauser that had just released a bullet because it went right into his skull. And that big giant that had taunted the Israelites, that big giant that had shouted profanities against their God, was standing before God in the twinkling of an eye and he received his judgment. And a 16-year-old boy that had nothing but the fear of God in his heart brought him down and conquered him that day. And because the Philistines were so shocked to see their massive giant warrior conquered, 
that same fear of God came into their hearts and they melted like wax. Everything was because of God and how God worked in the life of David. David could have chosen to say what everybody else said. Well, boys, we're up a creek without a paddle. We better all just, we better just try and find, a, 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 you know, some kind of way to, to broker a peace treaty because we can't conquer these people. But David was a different person. And when you read these things in the Bible, you realize why God says in his word that David was a man after his own heart because David's heart was filled with the fear of God. And therefore, he would not allow the fear of man to touch him. And therefore, we read of David's exploits and how wonderfully God looked after him and protected him. Would you like that in your life? I know I would. You know what? It's not that difficult. We have to come to the place that we begin to live the same life that David lived. You will always be confronted with situations where Satan wants you to bow to man. We say that wants you to fear man and compromise your principles. And God is going to expect you at that stage to stand firm and to stand strong, no matter what the fallout will be. Because God says to you, I will have your back. I will stand for you. Daniel is another man that we read of in the Bible. Daniel was confronted by the troops of King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel refused to bow. Daniel refused to acknowledge that the king was God. He would not bow to his statues. He would not accept what he said. He would not stop worshiping God. Knowing that that would mean a death sentence, Daniel said in his heart, I don't care. If this means I die, I die with peace in my heart that I still put God first. And so guess what they did? They were going to make an example of Daniel so that nobody else would follow his rebelliousness towards the king. And they sentenced him to be torn to pieces by the lions in the arena. And I can tell you now, when they threw him in that arena, they firmly believed that this was going to be a spectacle and by the time there's nothing left of Daniel, there will be nothing left of any resistance in the hearts of any of the Israelites. But what they did not realize is that by standing up for God, by refusing to be afraid of man and choosing to fear God above all else, God looked upon Daniel with favor and the hand of God moved. And the supernatural power of God was released into that arena. And the angels of God clamped the lion's mouths shut. When you looked at that lion, it might have been Garfield the cat. Because he was all playful, he was all happy, and he, he had no desire to destroy this man. Can you imagine... What must have gone through those people's minds when they saw this man who had refused and he said to everybody, I will not bow to no false gods. I will not bow to nobody except the God of Israel because he's the Lord of Lords and he's the King of Kings. And suddenly this man walks between the lions and nothing happens. How many people that day had a change of heart? I can't tell you, but it must have been plenty. God stood up for him because he stood up for God. Do you want God to stand up for you? You better be willing to stand up for God. We all need to guard our hearts because it's easy for us in a moment of weakness to start fearing man more than what we fear God. But when you start fearing man more than you fear God, you've given the devil place. The Bible warns us, give the devil no place. Have you ever encountered a situation where there was a rush of fear that went through you. Who's had that before? What did you feel? If you can describe it to me, what did you feel when that rush of fear came through? What would you say? Okay. 
would I be correct in saying, because I've heard a lot of people say that, that you felt you had no, no life in you, all the life drained out of you. Your knees go weak, you feel like you have no strength, and your, everything just buckles. You see, that's what fear does. Fear sucks the life out of you. How many of you have ever had a dream that something is chasing you? And you're trying so hard to get away, but your legs just don't work. You like you keep dragging your legs and your brain is telling your legs to run, but you can't. And this thing is coming for you. Or somebody is shooting at you and you're trying to shoot back, but your gun doesn't work or whatever. Have you had that stuff? Do you know what's behind that? It's the spirit of fear. But what you see in the dream is what he's doing to you in real life. Fear brings paralysis. Satan wants you to be paralyzed. He wants your life to be paralyzed because as a paralytic, you're not going to go nowhere. You're not going to go forward. You're not going to reach your destiny. You're not going to live your life. And he wants that fear to come into your heart. And unfortunately, sometimes we've already done that. We've already opened our hearts for that fear to come in. And it's like that paralysis has already stung your heart. And you need God's help. And then we have the story of Daniel's three friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Similar to Daniel, they refused to bow. They refused to worship. They refused to honor the king. They made a declaration that they would serve God and they would bow to God only. And so here comes the Babylonians once again needing to make a, make a statement, needing to stop this rebellious attitude as soon as possible. And so they decided there's something even worse than being torn to pieces by lions. We're going to take them and throw them into the fiery furnace. And so they got the furnace all burning. You know, when you go read this passage in the Bible, you will see that the guards that were sent to open the furnace doors got burnt up. They died. This furnace was so hot that when they opened the doors, the, the, the guards that opened the doors died. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was pushed in. And there they go into the furnace and they start walking around. They are not burning up. They are not being destroyed. And then even worse, they look in and then they're like, but wait a minute, wasn't there supposed to be three people in there? Why is there four people in there? Because one of God's angels, it might have been Christ himself, how do I know? Was standing there with them and the power of God surrounded them and they were 100% protected. Let me ask you a question. How many of the Babylonians had a change of heart that day and began to believe in God? Everybody that was there, because they all saw it. When Satan tried to destroy these three men, it was their fear of God and their refusal to fear man that saved them in a very supernatural way. It is impossible for us to be a true believer and have fear for the approval of men. Listen here. There are many places in this world that you are never going to fit in. God never wanted you to fit in. The only place that you should fit in is with God. We all need to come to a place that we make the same decision that David made, that Daniel made, that Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego made. And we must come to a place that we make the declaration, me, myself, my heart will always fear God more than I fear man. And let me tell you something, there are going to be times in your life where this will be tested, where somebody is going to come to provoke fear in you, where somebody is going to threaten you. They're going to tell you you're going to lose everything because of that. Let me remind you what happened to these people in the Bible. They didn't lose nothing, they gained everything. And even if Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had been burnt up that day, if we got to heaven one day and we spoke to them about it, they would say to you, I would do it all again in a heartbeat. Because for me, it's more important to honor God than to honor man. 
Jesus warned us in the book of John chapter 5, verse 44. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another, yet you make no effort to obtain praise that comes from the one and only God? He asks the question, he says, how can you call yourself a believer? If all you're doing is you're always looking for the favor of man, you're always looking for the praise of man, but you're not looking for the praise of God. If you and I are truly children of God, if we mean business with God, then I shouldn't be worried about what you think. I shouldn't be worried about what you think. I shouldn't be worried about what any man thinks. Because man's favor shouldn't mean nothing to me. But God's favor means everything to me. You know, the good news I have for you, when you truly walk a road with God, all the people that sneer at you, all the people that talk bad about you, all the backstabbers, all the whatever, will most probably not be there when you stand before God one day. But you will. The Bible says, if you can't confess God before man, don't expect God to confess you when, he stand, when you stand before him one day. Sometimes <clears throat> we are in a situation where we have the opportunity to stand for what we believe in. And immediately that pressure comes from the other side. Be quiet. Don't say nothing. What are these people going to think of you? You should also be aware of the other voice that's saying to you, if you stand for me today before men, I will stand for you one day before God. God will always bless those that have the courage and the strength of conviction to stand for him. So how do you avoid the fear of man? Number one, we must be confident in the scriptures of God over the wisdom of men. Psalm 119 verse 98 says, <clears throat> Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all of my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. Guys, why do we learn the word of God? Why do we allow ourselves to be taught the word of God? Because that's what will make the difference. There's a lot of people down here in this world that call themselves wise. The Bible says God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Because most people are wise in their own eyes. Do you know when you are really wise? When God says you're wise. Because all wisdom comes from God. And if you spend time in God's word, God adds wisdom to your life. God adds wisdom to your mindset, to your thinking. The second thing that's very important, we need to come to a place that we start avoiding wrong influences. Proverbs 22 verse 24 says, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one who is easily angered, or you may learn his ways, and you yourself will be ensnared. And that doesn't have to be about a hot-tempered man. The Bible says you must be very careful which alliances you make and which friendships you cherish. Because whatever you are linking yourself to will slowly but surely come over unto you. And ultimately, that will be how the enemy is going to try and pull you away. You know, I sometimes give an illustration. <clears throat> I don't have to give the illustration. I'm just going to explain it to you. If I have fallen into a pit and Albert wants to come and he wants to pull me out of the pit, it's always a lot easier for me to pull him down than it is for him to pull me up. How many Christians that at some point in time did love God, did profess Christ as their Savior, today are full-blown back in the world, 100% backslidden and totally off the path because they did not want to let go of certain things from their past. You see, the thing is you can't walk with Christ and dance with the devil at the same time. That's why... It is called repentance. Repentance means change, 180 degree 
change. If I was going this way, I stop, I turn around, and I go that way. But you know how the devil pulls us back? By our friendships, by our relationships, by the fear of man. And we need to understand that. The third thing that is important, we need to trust in God to help us and to protect us. Hebrews 13 verse 6, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can a man do to me? Is this difficult to do? I suppose so. Is this impossible to do? Definitely not. David did it. Daniel did it. Nebuchadnezzar did it. Paul did it. Peter might have fallen at one time, but after that he got up and he did it. Anybody that you read of in the Bible that made a difference some way did it. And God helped them. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. Tomorrow, the day after, somewhere in the future, you're going to be uh, confronted with some situation that you have no solution for. You're probably going to have a bunch of friends like uh, Job who's going to say to you, but where is your God? Where is the Savior that you keep talking about? And your heart might feel like it wants to turn to water and the fear might want to suck the life out of you. But you're going to have to force yourself to stand up and say, listen, I don't care what you people say. God is going to make a way for me. Because my faith is in him, not in you. My faith is in him, not in the world. God is my helper. The fourth thing, we must understand the ignorance and the incompetence of natural man. Psalm 62 verse 9 says, Low-born men are but a breath. The high-born are but a lie. I've, if weighed in balance, they are nothing together. They are only a breath. What does that mean? That's why you can't put your faith in men. You have to put your faith in God. Because man is nothing. Man is just a breath. He's a speck of dust. He's here today. He's gone tomorrow. But God is always around. And God is your helper. The fifth thing that's important, we must understand that we are here on earth to please God, not to please man. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Am I now trying to win approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of God. Ladies and gentlemen, a true servant of God is not in it to please man. A true servant of God is always in it to please God. And that's what makes you somebody in God's eyes. Amen. So, in closing, every one of you is going to be in a situation where the fear of man is going to try to touch your heart. And it's going to be up to you to make a decision what you're going to do. I want you to remember today's sermon. God expects you to stand firm. Listen to this last scripture. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or am I trying to win the approval of God? Or am I now trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. If you're sitting here today and you call yourself a servant of Christ, there is an easy test for that. The next time you are in a situation where it's easy for you to fear man, see whether you do that or you choose to stand, even if it makes you unpopular. I want to say to you that, <clears throat> speaking from my own life, I was given the opportunity to choose to fear man or to choose to fear God. I chose to fear God. I lost all my friends. I lost all my friends, every single one of them. But God brought me new friends. And can I tell you something about the new friends God brought me? They're people I can trust. They're people I can depend on. 
They're people that have my bank. They're people that support me. They're people that uphold me. They're people that help me. They are people through who God works in my life to bless me. And you know what? I don't miss any of the others. When God gave me the opportunity to make a decision to choose, I made the decision for him. And something else that I did, I did not keep it a secret. You know, when God touched and changed and transformed my life, I actually invited all my friends to a party. But I didn't tell them what the party was for. And at the party, I stood up and I said to them, guys, I have an announcement to make. Everybody looked at me with these big eyes. I said, I want you all to know that I've given my life to Christ. And from today, my life is different. And we used to do certain things together, but I can't do these things anymore. From today, my life is different. And I'm going to ask you, please, to respect my decision. And I said to them, you are more than welcome to come to my house, but you're going to leave the copious amounts of alcohol at home because it's not welcome in my house anymore. I didn't see them again. At that time, it bothered me a lot. But then something very interesting happened. Over the years, one by one, God brought every single one of them back into my life. And you know why they came back into my life? Because their lives fell apart. Because their lives hit rock bottom. Because they were in the pit. And guess what? None of them go to church. So who's the one person that they've seen over the years stay firm in his conviction, stay strong in his resolve, and always puts God first? It was me. So who did they phone? Me. Who led them to Christ? Me. Who brought them to salvation? Well, firstly, God. We give him all the glory for that. But he used me. Why? because I wasn't afraid to stand for what was right. Amen. Did anybody learn something today? Give the Lord a good word. <laughs> Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I thank you for the word of God. And I thank you that your word illuminates our understanding, shows us through revelation the desire of God's heart for our lives. Thank you, Lord, that your word fills us with wisdom, with knowledge, with insight, with understanding. And thank you, Lord, that your truth always sets us free. Today's message spoke to us about the necessity to stop fearing men. And for some of us, that's a difficult thing because maybe our whole life has been characterized by the fear of man. Well, you can't fear God and man at the same time. I pray that you help us. I pray that you touch us by the power of your Holy Spirit and that you touch our hearts, that where fear has an icy grip on us, the love of God and the fire of the Holy Spirit will melt the icy tentacles of fear. And I thank you, Lord, that you fill us with boldness. Jesus said to the disciples, do not leave the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And you will be my witnesses. Dear Lord, we need to be a witness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, of your holy name and of your kingdom. And looking at the words that Jesus used, you cannot do this on your own. We need help. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you help us. Thank you that you are, in fact, our helper. And whoever might be listening to this message, thank you that as they cry out to you, and as they yield to you, and as they lay down their fear of man, you fill them with power, and you fill them with boldness. I bless you with the power of God, and I bless you with the boldness that comes through the Holy Spirit. May the fire of God rest upon your lips. May you speak the words of God. May you speak in power. May you speak with conviction, and may you speak truth. In Jesus' name, amen.